Heather is the executive director of the Sovereign Foundation, and she'll be speaking on advancing identity and trust through diversity. A round of applause, please. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And I also want to give a special thank you to those of you who are in our sovereign community or sovereign stewards who have come out today to say hello and be here at the event. And while I like a good pitch deck with the best of it, with all of you, um, I understand that right now we're hitting the after lunch coma. And so I'm going to take a little bit of a different approach in talking with you today. I want to start and explain to you about when I was a child. One of my family's activities was to sit around the table with these. Let's see if we can, these. Do you recognize these? Those are lock picks. Yep. <laughs> We would spend hours um, trying to pick locks of all kinds, and it may be considered an odd family activity, but the fact is we learned to use a simple tool to solve a complex problem. We learned to look under the surface at what really made things work, and we learned to visualize solutions that we couldn't see with our eyes. My mom and dad worked in the space program at the Jet Propulsion Lab, building navigation systems for the Apollo, Gemini, and Skylab missions. My brother grew up to be an officer in the Army. I grew up and eventually went to journalism school. In a way, we all spend our time visualizing some story or chain of events and asking questions, seeking answers that aren't obvious, and having to dig for information, value, and truth. For all of us in this room, advancing the cause and mission of blockchain technology is no different. We look at simple ways to solve complex problems. We try to visualize solutions that run under the surface and power the world's business. And we all want to revolutionize innovate, and disrupt. But are we really doing the best job of that? In a more specific way, are we using all of our resources to drive change? Let's come back to that. First, let me tell you a bit about myself and work history and how I went from here to here to here with you today. I'm slightly built and Let's face it, I have what we'll call a unique voice. <laughs> and at the heart of it, I'm an introvert. I don't necessarily look like the leader or risk taker, yet I started off in high school and took a chance and ran for and won the Office of Class President three times and Student Body President my last year. And then I graduated and went off to a small university in the Pacific Northwest, and once again, this seemingly insignificant, slightly built, shy girl took another chance and won the Office of Student Body President, the first and only woman president to serve two terms in the 177 year history of the institution. And as a graduate at Willamette University, I studied political science. But after graduation, I was drawn into a different world, the world of news reporting, almost by accident, but simply because someone who knew me thought and knew what I had done with myself, looked beyond the words on my degree, and thought I might be good at it. So, with no experience, I took an entry-level job answering newsroom telephones. Something anyone could do, really, but it was the first time and not the last time that someone gave me an opportunity that could have and perhaps should have gone to someone with a more traditional journalism background. But I worked and learned and observed and brought an outsider's eye to my work. And I again took a chance and applied to journalism school with the aim of becoming a news industry insider. I graduated from Columbia University with a master's in journalism and came to Washington, D.C. 
I did the job of a reporter, learning and absorbing the culture, making errors, and making progress, and becoming a full-fledged reporter. I might have looked young and sounded young. In fact, some say I still sound young. But I was willing to put in the time and put myself on the line and do what needed to be done. And then I campaigned for and won the role of chairman of the Congressional Radio TV Correspondents Association. And although I worked in the industry, my age and my gender on Capitol Hill made me a bit of an outsider with this group. And I needed the members to look past my experience, past my appearance, and the sound of my voice. I became the youngest chairman of the Congressional Correspondents Association in the history of the seat, following in the footsteps of American journalists like David Brinkley, Roger Mudd, Charlie Gibson, and other iconic industry legends. In an industry that was as much about who you knew as what you knew, I was both lucky and successful in that endeavor because enough of the industry insiders gave me a chance and weren't blinded by my age or how I looked. But eventually the old guard, the insiders, the good old boys network took their toll and I left the news business in 2009, burnt out from fighting to prove myself to a group of people who despite my accomplishments could only see how I looked, saw my appearance, how I sounded, and only saw my limitations. I had zero experience or training in any other field. So once again, I set off as an outsider and a newcomer, making a decision as we call it, pivoting, and went to business school. But when after all that hard work, I got my MBA, no one would hire me for two years. I didn't fit the role as a business insider a technology insider. I wasn't a businesswoman. I hadn't worked in the industry. I didn't have traditional tech experience. One day, I was in a museum not far from my apartment, and I started talking to a woman at the information desk in the course of a friendly conversation. I happened to mention that I was looking for work, I wanted to work in technology, and I was in the midst of a career change. It turns out that her husband worked for a company called Newstar, a data analytics firm, and she saw something in the way I spoke or the way I carried myself, or perhaps she just felt sorry for me. And she convinced her husband to give me an interview. Her husband was a vice president working in registry services, not the most exciting field, conservative and boring. But this gentleman was an innovator. He valued diversity. He valued ideas over pedigree. And he took a chance on an industry outsider who didn't look the part and didn't fit the mold. I got the job knowing nothing about what they did or how they did it. But I learned, and I watched it with the eyes of a reporter bringing a different perspective and viewpoint and new ideas. And in the course of doing my work, learning and absorbing the culture, asking questions, making errors, and making progress, I was cited by global research firms like Forrester and Gartner for creating new industry standards and best practices for my role. I was able to do things that no one else had done precisely because I didn't think the same way they did about the same things. About a half decade of working at Newstar, I saw how powerful the new world of technology could be, powerfully good and powerfully destructive. I saw how technology was treating individuals, and I decided to take another chance and make another change. After I left that job, a colleague of mine, a PhD computer scientist, and I combined our skill sets and wrote a series of children's books. <laughs> they say, write what you know, and that's exactly what we did. We wrote graphic novels about technology and cybersecurity and wrote about being an outsider learning the ropes. Our teenage hero brings ignorance to his role as a fighter of cyber crimes. He's an outsider learning about cyber threats and how they can be defeated. But he also brings something valuable, questions. He asks why and how, and he asks why not. After publishing the books, we decided to start a little company called Syngitech. And we built an app that challenged the status quo. 
when it came to the idea on the collection of data. Starting a company, even for the most experienced of us, is always an uphill battle, especially against the status quo. And to make it even harder, at the time, we put privacy forward as the value prop. We allowed families to own their data. We took an outsider's view and gave them privacy at a time when no one was talking about privacy and everyone thought we were crazy to talk about privacy. We all talk about privacy now, even if some of us don't believe in privacy. But soon enough, as GDPR is proving, we will all have to believe it, at least in a practical way. So my company then linked up with another little company that shared the same philosophy, and we developed some cutting-edge technology that could help families know that their messages were secure, their data unsiloed, and their digital lives were finally controllable by, them, by the families themselves. Since then, the company with which we partnered has grown, it was acquired, it morphed, and finally sp spawned something called Sovereign. It is a revolution in privacy, a revolution in digital identity, using the power of Hyperledger Indy. But comic books and kids has been my identity for the past four years. And I dealt with investor after investor who couldn't see past the comics and see the technology. And they couldn't value what we were offering beneath the surface because, as I've heard over and over, I just did kids stuff. So I was asked to be on the board of Sovereign. And later, I was asked to lead the foundation because someone was able to see past the comic books and the kids app and saw what was under the surface of our application. And more importantly, that the value of a person with a different background would bring value. Sovereign is a nonprofit foundation of which I'm the executive director and CEO. We have a goal of becoming a global public utility, providing the infrastructure for self-sovereign digital identity. It's interoperable, accessible to anyone. It has no reference to nationality, commercial or government affiliation. It's a true revolution in digital rights. Self-sovereign identity using blockchain technology can solve business problems while protecting individual rights. And it does it with sharing and trust. The end game here is to change the way information about individuals is exchanged, protecting individuals while expediting process. When combined with technology brought to our ecosystem by innovative stewards like the ones that are here and vendors, there are endless applications in everything from IoT to humanitarian work. I could go on and on about technology and blockchain and ledgers, and I, but I really have a larger point here. It's sovereign, we've built a culture of diversity and inclusion, starting with our global business partners and stewards who are operating nodes around the world. Diversity exists on two levels, what you see and what you get. While site and substance may be tied together, often they're not. When we talk about diversity, we often think about gender or skin color or nationality or language, but diversity should not be defined by those phenotypic traits. It is important that we look deeper for a more nuanced version of diversity, including people with a different phenotype may help innovation. However, we need to understand why that's the case. Cultural or racial or gender diversity may bring innovation to your organization, but it may not. If phenotypic differences drive innovation, they do so because people with a different look or culture or gender or religion have had uniquely different sets of life experiences. Phenotypic diversity drives innovation because the differences in our lives led by the individual in your organization. True diversity is the diversity of thought processes and of perspectives. It is a diversity of ideas, some of which can come as a byproduct of what you can see on the surface. But true diversity is not simply a surface observation. It is found in the, in the genotype, to co-opt another phrase from biology, the true makeup of an individual that you can't readily observe. 
How do you find that? Simply by opening your eyes and your mind and looking past the phenotype to the diversity of ideas, backgrounds, experiences, and knowledge that an individual can bring. When you open your mind to hiring someone who looks different, sounds different, comes from another industry, or someone that doesn't fit the mold, you bring a new perspective into your organization. You bring someone who may be able to see the forest through the trees because they have lived a different life from you. They have lived a life that's different from what you have defined as typical or the ideal applicant. You can hire someone that's like me, who has a wealth of experience in a totally unrelated industry with the knowledge that there will always be parallels with the knowledge that a newcomer will ask questions in order to understand what you do. Many of those questions, while self-evident to you, may lead to the uncovering of gaps in your, your own knowledge and a better way of doing things, or new opportunities that you have yet to evaluate or identify. They say the best way to learn a subject is by teaching someone who knows nothing. Who in this room has a child? How many of you have heard the questions, why is the sky blue? Where are the stars? But the very task of explaining these things solidifies your knowledge and may even force you to learn more about something you thought you knew. Diversity is not doing the same old thing. <laughs> With blockchain and self-sovereign identity, we're building a new way of doing something that has essentially been done for centuries. In my organization, one way we're doing that is by opening our minds to a diversity of thought. My career has been defined by doing things no one, not even myself, believed I could or would do. We speak of disruption. It's a handy buzzword, isn't it? But what is really disruptive? How do we innovate? How do we bring all the available resources to bear in the furtherance of our causes? The answer is use every available resources, not simply the resources that are currently at your disposal, or those resources you see on the surface, or those that come from the usual places, or those that are your ideal candidate for the exact job description that you've written. Innovation is not a key you press. It's a way of thinking. It's a strategy, a religion, if you will, and it works best with both layers of diversity. The fact is, try new things with new people who have new ideas, find resources that no one else sees. Give someone like me a chance to bring new perspective to your business. So look around, find new people, find new ideas, and here's the key, actually try them, get them beyond the PowerPoint slides. Don't do the same thing over and over and expect different results. Even if you are and always will be an insider, force yourself to think like an outsider. And if you can't do that, hire someone who is an outsider. If all this seems like too radical idea, let's go back to the locks. Once upon a time, there was no such thing as a lock. Can you imagine a time when a lock on a door was an innovation? According to my Google search, that happened about 6,000 years ago on this continent in Egypt. The locks and keys were made of wood and were used for about 4,000 years until the Romans, masters at taking the best ideas they encountered in their vast empire, decided to make a lock with metal. But the technology inside the lock is the same. It's pens and tumblers, and it's worked with a key, or picked by someone like me who knows how to use the tools. I recently bought an old house built the same year the American Revolution ended in 1783. These are the original locks on the original doors of my home. Are they better than the ones that came before them? A little. Are modern locks better than these? A little. But they are really the same solution to the same problem. 
For the record, I do lock my doors, but any lock, ancient or modern, is only a piece of technology, and especially those of us in cybersecurity know that any person ingenious enough can get past them. So sitting around with my family at the dinner table, trying to see in a small metal padlock like this one, I learned a valuable lesson. Every person has talent, experiences, and skills that exist within them. If only someone would take the time to look beneath the surface. Our future lies with people, and with the integration of humanity, trust, and technology in this new digital world. No matter how good it is, any given technology will eventually be supplanted by something better. What we must be, we must keep building these new technologies like blockchain, it's a good technology and it will change the world. But the instant you think that it is the best is the instant that someone with a more open mind or a different way of thinking or a different set of experiences will come up with a better idea. Put your investment in people, in people of all kinds from all walks of life. They will outlast the technology. True disruption in any market rarely comes from insiders. Insiders can succeed, insiders can make money, but outsiders disrupt and innovate. We have to take risk and force ourselves to do non-traditional things in non-traditional ways and often with non-traditional people. It's an idiom that's used over and over again. But often, we cannot see the forest through the trees. Only an outsider can see the forest and tell you which way to walk to get to the edge. And we all want to stay on the leading edge of technology, don't we? Because, let's face it, in a world of brown Wookiees, you'll want to stop and have your picture taken with the pink one. Thank you. Thank you very much for that, Heather.